Good evening, ladies, and welcome to our installment regarding Elul and Rosh Hashanah. We are going to be having a three parts, three parts for this uh, for this session for this, uh, this I, these ideas. We do a lot from the Machser. Today, I'm taking the Aleinu prayer because I just feel I can't let go of it. I've been doing it for years, and I just feel it is so inspiring. I want to present that to you again tonight. Um, we'll also talk about Elo. Then we're going to be doing the next two weeks. The third week, um, Rosh Hashanah is on Tuesday, Wednesday. So we're going to be having, wait a minute. No, it's after, it's after Yom Kippur that we have a problem. Okay, if before Yom Kippur rather. So before Rosh Hashanah, we're fine. And we'll be having this at 8 p.m. But tonight we're doing a special 7 p.m. edition. Okay, so let's talk about the... Um, the ideas concerning Rosh Hashanah and how we can prepare ourselves. Now we have to remember this is the month that says Anila Dodi Dodili that stands for Elul. I am my beloved and my beloved is for me. And the whole idea of Elul, we have to remember, we have to sum it up in a few words. The idea of Elul is to take that there's tremendous um, power given to us by Hashem. When they say he's in the fields, that means he is, we can feel it. It's more tangible, Kedusha. We feel the upcoming high holidays coming and we're going to be standing in judgment and hopefully doing tshuva. So Elul is, bestows us with tremendous opportunities. If we just grab it, you can accomplish much more in Elul, says the Bali Musa, than you can during the rest of your year. If you just take advantage of the timely situation, anything you undertake now will be, will be blessed spiritually. So it's a very important time. I mean, Victor Miller asked the question, and um, I always found it fascinating, and I'm going to bring it again. He mentions that, um, interestingly enough, a mere two weeks before Elul is what's called Tuba Av, the 15th day of Av. That's like, according to the Gemara, this is from Victor Miller, that's the day where the summer is in its zenith. Like the, everything's in full bloom and the crickets are cricketing and the frogs are croaking and everything else is in full, full display. And it's interesting. Why does El always follow the summer? And we have to change channels. And it's so hard for young mothers to sending their kids off to school. All of a sudden you just run in from your summer break. And then you all of a sudden have, you have the, you know, the, 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 the severity of Elul and, and with all its implications and all the things you want to do with yourself. And here you're thrown, all these things are thrown at you, like schoolwork and all kinds of things you have to all of a sudden adjust to. But there's, there's a meaning behind all this. And he mentions like this. Really, it says, Hashemayim Mesaprim Kavod Kale. It says in Tehillim that the heavens uh, cry out the glory of Hashem. What's the glory of Hashem in the heavens? Victor Miller says the main, who's the Hassan who Yotzei Mi Chupaso in the next verse of that Tehillim? Who is the groom that comes out of his chupa? That's the sun. The sun is the most magnificent. Other than Hashem, the sun takes second best. It's, it's a whole miracle. I once heard from Pam Zetzal. He mentions that the sun has an, an, an amazing thing. It would be too close to the earth, we would burn, God forbid. It would be too far from us, we'd freeze. And exactly the right amount is given, even in Toronto, for people to survive. It's amazing how it's exactly calculated. But the sun gives all the energy to the world. Every plant, every animal, the whole food cycle, all bases itself on photosynthesis. And if it would not be for the sun's powers, the whole world as we know it would not exist. We need the sunlight. And it's amazing, the power of, of sight is a total miracle of better than any camera, how it bounces it off your eyes and comes to the world, the, the way the light registers, unbelievable. It says that the, um, the, the Malachim and Shemayim, when they see the sunlight, they say Kedusha every morning. They say Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. The, 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 there's a Kol Rosh Kadol. They're like enthralled with this entity called sunlight. And we in Toronto can especially understand this concept, given that we don't have much of it during the year. So when summer finally comes, that's the zenith of, of everything. Hashem is bestowing upon us the greatest, greatest gift. Everyone wants to be outside and it's magnificent and beautiful. And, and, and that light, that sunlight is so magnificent with blue skies and everything that it entails in summer is a, an amazing time of year. 
Remember, Victor Miller always says the sunlight, if somebody ever complains it's too hot in the summer, they have to realize Hashem is busy cooking. The ovens are busy baking the peaches and the cherries and everything else that comes to us. So the, the cooking is going on in the summer for the harvest that's going to be a little bit later. But it's unbelievable, the middle of the summer. Now, in, in fact, all the major Jewish holidays, says Rabbi Victor Miller, surround the summer. But the closest one to the summer is Rosh Hashanah, and it's not for naught. You know, Rosh Hashanah marks, every holiday has two functions. Rabbi Dessler says this, and I'm, some, I'm bringing some ideas from Zalman Saretskin as well as itself, that every holiday gives us an audio visual. And it also gives us, the audio visuals explain more of what the holiday is supposed to, how it will digest it better, will digest it better. And um, as well, Rev Dessler says, every holiday is not just a commemoration. It's actually a re-experiencing of that situation. What is Rosh Hashanah? Rosh Hashanah is Hayom Haras Olam. This is when man was conceived, when man was born, when man came for the first time, he opened his eyes and he saw creator. Had man not committed his first sin, what would have happened? We would have had Gan Eden and everything that it entails and all, how, you know, the, all the presence of the world. Because ideally, says Rev. Victor Miller, Hashem loves us and we have to understand he gave us all the good things in the world. Why? He wanted man, this is his expression, with watermelon dripping down his beard to, to do tshuva. Chuba is supposed to be the highest level of chuba is from love. Hashem wants us, he doesn't want just chuba, oh, you did something terrible. Chuba really means to return. He wanted man to return to his roots. He wanted man to come back to, to see all the goodness. And with that saying, Hashem, I owe you so much. How could I have done anything ever against you? It's coming, the way to best come close to Hashem is to appreciate all the kindness he does for us. And what's better than right after the summer? That's really the ultimate. That's, that's really what Rosh Hashanah is supposed to bring to us. It's, 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 because purpose of tshuva, really, Rosh Hashanah in some ways is higher than Yom Kippur. Purpose of tshuva is to be one with Hashem. And that's what Rosh Hashanah represents, to, to crown Hashem, coronate Hashem as king, and, um, and, and not to get set up in our sins. Our sins is Yom Kippur. This is just a day where it's a holiday of monotheism. It's to reestablish our vows with Hashem. It's our anniversary. This is when you create, this is when I was born. And this is when I, a man's mandate really is to create himself on Rosh Hashanah, is to recreate himself. And it's unbelievable. This, this holiday has so much power to it that in every temple, synagogue, everywhere, they are all running to Shul. Now, why would people pick Rosh Hashanah? It have to be so long in Shul. You think they pick Hanukkah. Well, they pick maybe that too because of its proximity to another holiday, which I won't mention here. But um, the, the fact that they chose the high holidays shows the power of them, that people even people so far from Torah can't let go of it. They can't let go. It's really a time that's going to penetrate your whole essence. And with the joy of summer, for a person to, to internalize, look, Hashem, look what you've given to me and what I owe you back. Now, these last few years have been Corona, and I know people that are suffering right now, so I feel like I have to give an addendum. What about those people that didn't have such a great summer? There are people like that that had difficult times. And uh, there are people going through difficult times. So the answer for them is Rabbi Dessler gives another idea, which I'm just going to amplify, uh, explain in a different way. He doesn't give it like this, but I'm, I'm taking his words at taking the liberty, using his words. But Dessler says that a person really, after a Tisha now, it's that glory of summer, the hottest time, the most pleasant time, and never we lost two Bate Mikdash. But it's a reason why that has to precede Rosh Hashanah. Because when a person experiences any kind of tragedy, they realize how this world is so transitory, how this world is so temporary, how it's, as Rebetzin Steinman's, that's a, as the Colonel of Rachel used to say, a narasha beltala, a foolish world. This foolish world gives us nothing. So we can look back, we should appreciate the beautiful views of the world and the gorgeous sunlight and the gorgeous uh, scenery that we have around us. But the main thing here is that we are supposed to realize that this world is transitory and that should lead us to the proper idea of Rosh Hashanah. Can everyone see me? I'm just, I hope we have the right view. Are we have the right view? Yeah? Okay, because I don't see whatever, I don't know. Okay.
Now, I brought this down before, but this time I have a different uh, take on some on, on a Gemara that I quoted for many years from a Bessler. Um, this year, I, I, I got a different interpretation because I just learned it perfunctorily. This year, I asked my son to amplify it for me, and I got a, a little bit different spin on this Gemara that I've quoted for years. So this time, we'll say it a little bit different. First of all, this is very important. Rosh Hashanah represents to us, before we get into the Aleinu, Rosh Hashanah represents to us a concept called the Chirat Klalit, or Bechira Klalist, which means... It's a major choice day. And that's why we need all this preparation because it's a day to clean out our brains. We're supposed to have the right perspective on Rosh Hashanah and that should lead our whole year. Now, we make major decisions in our life. Like sometimes the place we go to school, the profession we choose, whom we marry, there's where we move, things like that can affect your whole life. Your whole life is affected by things like that. Rosh Hashanah is considered in that leak of major decision days because that's like when the engine's turned on to the highest, that's the bar that's going to lead your entire year. I have to say, you don't have to be all inspired on Rosh Hashanah. There's some people, low Elena, that could be sick. There's some people that could be with small children. The main thing is what you do on Rosh Hashanah, not what you feel on Rosh Hashanah. It's what you do, how you decide to spend your time. That's why... Everything we eat, we say all these kind of Yihirat zones when we eat all kinds of foods because we're supposed to be focusing on the fact that, that everything we do on Rosh Hashanah has meaning and will influence our entire year. The only other day that has as much influence in our lives as Rosh Hashanah, if not more, is God forbid, we shouldn't know from it, in the, <laughs> is the, but we will know from it, it's the day of one's death. It says that that's also a day of Bahira Klalis. Rav Dessler says a person gets a, an additional inspiration on that day. And on that day of their major inspiration, that person has choices. And we're only going to be down here for a few minutes. We're going to come back up to inspiration in a moment. But I want to explain more about, because Rosh Hashanah is the same idea. That it says that a person sees some kind of light inspiring them. And whatever they've been working on their entire lifetime is what will come out in them is what will come out when this, and you get a major test on the last day on earth. The Ramban even goes as far as to say that a person should put in their will that I want to give a general a proclamation that if I say or do anything at my last moments, I didn't mean it. If I say anything against Hashem, God forbid. Like that's how intense it is. There's a story the Shevet Musser tells about a highwayman who was, um, this particular highwayman like felt like doing shuva. He called the Shevet Musser, who was a big tzaddik in the 1600s, I believe. He called him to his bedside and he said he wanted to repent. And uh, when he got there, the, 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 so, so, so Shevet Musser says, okay, say bidui. And, you know, confess for your sins. And this highwayman says, I can't. I see a malach with a sword stretched out against me saying, if you say bidui, I'll chop you into pieces. That's how intense the test is the day of one's death. And similarly, there's the test like that for a person on Rosh Hashanah. And that's our, you know, this is like us, this is how we're going to start our year, what we want to do with our year, what's important to us during our year. It says you're not supposed to sleep on Rosh Hashanah, it's such an important day, and you shouldn't uh, speak anything extraneous or do anything extraneous because, I mean, you could sleep if you really need it for your davening, but um, to just fool around and luxuriate, that's not what Rosh Hashanah is about. This Gemara and Brachas, and here's where the changes come in, for those of you with brilliant minds that remember what I've said the last few years. Um, this Gemara and Brachas talking about whether the, the dead know about this world or not. The story of a man, my son told me that it was, the, it, it was he's called a chassid in the Gemara. So I used to think it was a man having an argument with his wife, but it's not. It's actually a man who is very righteous. Um, some people say it was Rabbi Yehuda Bar Eloi, perhaps. Uh, they postulate someone in the time of the Gemara. And something happened on the night of Rosh Hashanah that he had to leave his house. So I thought they got into an argument. My son told me, according to what he read, that really what happened was his wife chased him out of the house for whatever reason. His wife sent him out of the house. A, something he did upset her. So what happened was, 
He, where are you going to go in the time of Talmudic times? You get into an argument. It's good to go outside and air yourself out before you say words that you're going to regret. So, you know, today, like I picture the Toronto example, be go, go around up and down the aisles of Metro or Shoppers Drug Mart. And, uh, you know, that's where you can hide yourself. There were no motels to check into in Talmudic times in Eretz Yisrael on the night of Rosh Hashanah. So he went to the cemetery. That's the only place he could go to. He found himself in the cemetery and all of a sudden he hears voices. One voice says, come out with me and we'll, we'll see what's going on in the world together. And the other voice says, I can't, I'm rasp, wrapped up in a bundle of reeds. I can't go out with you. So um, the third voice pops in, what's going to be big in this world this year? So someone said barley. I'm just giving you an example. It was some type of special crop that they were talking about. And um, okay, he heard voices. So he felt that was enough. He went, he was a farmer by profession. So he went home to his wife. He apologized for whatever it was that she was upset with him for. And that year when it came time to planting crops, he usually was a wheat farmer. And this year he decided, I'm just saying the name, but I don't know if it's accurate, but he, he planted that particular crop, which was not so popular. And lo and behold, the prices were for some reason in high demand. There wasn't much of it. He had a bumper crop. He became fabulously wealthy from that year. The next year he decided on his own, he told his wife he wants to go for a walk and guess where he went? Here's the same thing repeated itself. Actually three years in a row that uh, he went and this year was another crop, a different crop altogether. He comes home, his wife is looking at him strangely, whatever, where were you? He says, I just had to go out a little bit. And then comes time to planting. He chooses an unusual plant thing again, plants it, bumper crop, it becomes fabulously wealthy. Three years in a row, fabulously wealthy. After the third year, his wife starts hounding him. She says, listen, something, you know something, you're, you're, you're making these, what, you have Ruach HaKodesh? Like, what, what, do you have prophecy? Like, why are you getting these, these messages all the time? And he finally told her, and uh, he told her the whole thing as he heard it in the cemetery. And what happened was his wife met up with the mother of a deceased daughter who was wrapped up in the bundle of reeds and he recounted, and because he knew who it was, his wife told the woman, and the, uh, she told the woman that I saw your daughter, and my husband saw a vision of your daughter wrapped up in a bundle of reeds. And then afterwards, he tried to go a fourth year, and they told them they know about us in this world already. We can't repeat this. So this is the Gemara and Brachas. And the question is asked, do the people that are deceased know about this world or not? And the answer given is, Rabbi Yonis and Ibshit says, um, these and those, elu elu. that's what he says. So if Dessler explains, some people, like for example, we hear stories of Yirmiyahu having, having to wake up our forefathers to daven for the Jewish people, or Mordechai Tzadik having to wake up the forefathers to daven. And yet here we see in the dream, there are these people following the latest uh, farm news, you know, and they know from it in the world to come. So which one is it? So Dessler explains that it depends on your madrega. He said, people like our forefathers who couldn't wait to, to divest themselves of this world, they, as soon as they, they couldn't wait, less the little attachment to this world, they were not attached to anything particularly, they couldn't wait. Whereas people that were like all their lives into what's the latest in farming and they're into almanacs and all the things that are relevant for farmers, they were very aware of you know, the news. So when they die, he explains to Dessler that whatever you made of yourself in this world, that's what you're like in the world to come. It's your inner world that has to be developed. If you're, if you're into this, that, or the other, they don't have it in the next world. <laughs> whether it's jealousy, whether it's uh, d d taiva, whether it's any kind of desires, whether any kind of covet you want, they don't, you can't get that in, this, in the next world. So you still have this desire which can't be fulfilled and you're stuck. And the more a person divests themselves in this world from these kind of things, okay, of course, appreciate. Where Victor Miller would say you have to appreciate every drop of everything, but we can't be enslaved to it. And, and we can't be enslaved to any one of our, uh, and, and, and people don't realize to what degree they're ruled by their various urges inside. Their mitos rule over them. And, and, and sometimes, um, have, 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 you know, they, they, we don't know to what degree our Midos have control of us in this world, that we are forever 
chasing things. But in the world to come where you can't fill it, that's the pain of Gehenna is where a person has things that can't follow up on it. So those people in the dream, I heard, I don't remember where my source is from, but the person that was in a bundle of reeds in the olden days, if a person was poor, they used to bury people um, in coffins, but um, maybe this was Klitzel Arts, because today in Eretz they're buried not in coffins, they're buried only in Klitzel Arts in coffins, and it's only to satisfy the government regulations. But it used to be that they would have different standards of, you know, the, the, of varying people, and people who were very poor would be in a bundle of reeds. What was this person saying, the person that was de deceased? She was saying a lot of things in her life she couldn't deal with because she was always feeling that her poverty held her back. She was embarrassed. She was embarrassed. I was buried in a bundle of reeds. I am a bundle of reeds. Like, who am I to speak? Who am I to say? And she didn't deal with a lot of things she could have dealt with in this world because her her thing, she was so obsessed with the fact that she didn't have, that held her back. And these other people were so into their farming, you know, that that was still going on in the world to come because that's what really occupied their minds. And that's how we have to think, like, whatever you are left with, when you leave this world, it's like walking into another room. And whatever you felt or thought, now, of course, we are a work in progress. We're not expected to be Avram Avinu and Maishu Rabbeinu. We're expected to be, like, for example, I don't want to be tough on hotline. He always says, if you talk about Bitachan, if you work on Bitachan, then you're called in Shemaim a Baal Bitachan. In our generation, especially when we're in such a lowly generation and the world around us is a cesspool, there's no other word for it. So in this world that we live in, if we try for anything, we're given tremendous, tremendous reward. You know, as if, as if, just making efforts in a certain direction. You don't have to be, you know, God takes some people earlier, he takes some people later, but we are here to keep plugging away and working on ourselves so that that's what we are for the world to come. This is reminiscent of Rosh Hashanah. The same idea exists for Rosh Hashanah. Bechira Klalit or Bechira Klalis is a general major decision time that can affect our entire year is made on Rosh Hashanah. How are we going to spend our life? What are we doing with ourselves? How are we going to exist? So that's just some little ideas I wanted to present to you. Let's get right into the Aleinu, which is an amazing prayer. You could grab it in your sitter, your machzer, wherever it is, if you have the Aleinu around you. Aleinu becomes a central focus of Rosh Hashanah. It's in the Musaf of Rosh Hashanah both days, and it's extremely significant. Let's talk about it for a minute. We're going to Aleinu. Okay, first of all, uh, the Nefesh Shimshons tells us that Yoshua bin Nun, Yoshua, the prime disciple of Moshe Rabbeinu, composed the Aleinu when they crossed the Jordan River. And, um, and the whole idea is, the Sifse Chaim explains that Yericho, when they crossed, the, you know, they got to, they were, they were when they crossed the, the Jordan River, I'm sorry, it's when, it, not just crossing Jordan River, when they conquered Yericho. And Yericho was considered, even though it was one of the finest cities, the beautiful city, it's Irhat Marim, it's city of dates. Today it's an Arab, uh, basically under Arab hands, but it's, it is a beautiful city in Eretz Yisrael. And Yericho, I mean, we own it, but it's mostly Arab city. In any case, but um, it was the whole idea of Yericho when it came tumbling down, it was the destruction of so much idolatry and all kinds of lowliness. The Canaanites were known to be very low life people into all kinds of desires and all kinds of like idolatry. So that was like the demonstration of the fall of everything ugly in Hashem's eyes. That's what it represented. So the Chidam mentions that the Anshe Knesset HaGadola, those were the latter prophets and some, and some of the greatest sages that ever lived, they decided to incorporate it in our sitter. And originally it was only to be said on Rosh Hashanah. Only, it was only to be said once a year. If Yochanan ben Zakkai decided that once we were exiled, we should say it every day at the end of Tefillah, the end of our prayers, because it says Rosh Hashanah gets back to the, I mean, Elenu gets back to the basics of Rosh Hashanah to proclaim that what, what we're here in the world for, and that that's the way to close your prayers, and that seals your prayers properly. 
Now, women are not obligated in an Aleinu every day if you have time, fine, but it's definitely not on the top 10 list of the top 10 prayers to say. If you have time, for sure you should say it, but if there's a whole list, if anybody wants, I have what Rabbi Lowy says is your order of tefillos if you don't have time. But in any case, um, he said to see, you know, to see God's hand in the gullus, they decided to say it three times a day. Now, originally, the Chidah says the Aleinu prayer has all the praises in the world in it. And it, um, some of Rav Shimon Schwab says a lot of people that were sage that were sages in the Gemara were upset at first when Rav Yochanan Ben Zakkai did this because they felt how could Aleinu be said every day? It was so holy, it should only be said on Rosh Hashanah. Okay, anyways, let's get into it. So the first word should jump out at, at us living in North America or any country in the world today, the Western world, Aleinu, it's incumbent upon us. The world talks about where is my entitlement? What's coming to me? Aleinu says we have obligations. When we have a summer, we have obligation to be appreciative of what we just got. Today's society talks about rights, but we, we as Jews are supposed to talk about responsibilities. Rav Shach says that in the 10 commandments, when we heard God saying, or we heard Moshe Rabbeinu saying, Lo sisa shem ashav, you should not use God's name in vain. The whole world shook because we have to take this world as a vehicle to get closer to Hashem. And if we're just taking it in vain, we never use it to get closer to Hashem or never use it for our responsibilities. What are we here in the world for? The world is in vain then. Are we using this world in vain? We say that Ham, the son of, of uh, I'm sorry, the son of Noah, his son, Ham, all people from Ham were known to be expert gardeners. Or Victor Miller says, particularly one, one tribe of the Canaanites, the Chibi, they were also expert gardeners. They made the world, the Eretz Yisrael beautiful. So when the Jews conquered it, it was already very highly gardened. I think that's why a lot of Jews often move into Italian neighborhoods that at the Italians were there before us. And then we come, they already fixed it all up and planted fig trees and whatever else they planted everywhere around us. But in any case, the, they, they, but look what happened with Ham. They, they were, they appreciated is they appreciate land. They were gardeners. They said they could taste the soil and decide what should be planted in a particular area. However, look at how lowly they are. They never got close to Hashem from that skill. But look how many doctors learned the intricacies of the human body. And many of them are atheists. They don't appreciate, you know, the greatness of their creator. So Aleinu, we have an obligation. We have an obligation to appreciate and, and sing songs of praises to Hashem and not just give a shopping list when we daven. We have obligations, responsibility of gratitude, of prayer, of many things. L'shabeach, to praise. The Malbim says the word shevach means to improve. Basically, it could mean two things. Either we have an obligation to improve ourselves or to improve our relationship with Hashem, which are really basically one and the same. We're supposed to perfect ourselves. That's what praise is for. La Adon Hakol. God is the cent should be the center of our universe. The center of our universe. Man was created. He saw that the word Adon is what how we pronounce Hashem's name today. Um, there's a higher name, Yud Kei Vav Kei, which they said at the time of the temple. We say that name because it shows that God is our total master over everything. Master of the universe center of everything, center of our world. He should be the center of our world. Let's say skidula, to ascribe greatness. What does ascribe greatness mean? One of two things. Rev Dessler says that there's, uh, ascribe greatness means there's no such thing in this world as something small. Basically, by the way, everything I'm going to say in the Aleinu, except when I try to say something different is from Rev Dessler. Um, so Rav Dessler says there's no such thing as a small thing in Hashem's eyes in this world. Everything has tremendous relevance. Another interpretation for Rav Victor Miller is that whenever we say gedula, gadol in davening, it always means chesed, because that's where Hashem's greatness is the most apparent. Even if someone's going through hardships, um, they do see, you can, if you look closely enough, you'll see a beautiful world out there. And... Um, Lasei Skidula, we're here to ascribe greatness that Hashem does a lot of chesed for us. So those are the two meanings of 
you know, that everything, like let's say Scuola, for example, is food chain. All of a sudden there's a toad walking along or a, or a turtle and a bug flies right into his mouth. And from that nourishment, the turtle or the frog does this. And then there's another animal that eats the frog and then that animal, whatever, all these things, just how the whole world works, exists on chains. And it's uh, incredible how we're fed and how, how sunlight happens and, and all the different things. If they're not small things, yet we take them for granted. Or Victor Miller says, one square foot of ground has a greater population of organisms than the population of New York City. One square foot of ground filled with teeming with all kinds of things that I don't want to describe. That's why when we say hamotzi, lecha, minahar, it's filthy, dirty ground with all kinds of things in it that are not to be described now, especially if someone's eating supper. But those things become, you know, have become great. Their greatness, every, there's no such thing as a small things, as a small thing, Tashem. Let's say skewed a lot, describe greatness, le yotzer bereshis. Yotzer is present tense. Yotzer bereshis means he who mm -hmm. fashions, who, who, who creates, the one who fashions creation. Now it's in present tense. What do you mean? He created already. We are supposed to believe that Hashem is creating at every given moment. He's constantly creating, constantly renewing, every day a change to benefit humanity, develop, to benefit the Jewish people. There's, uh, you know, we mention a lot in our davening, every yanta basically is Zecher Letzias Mitzrayim. It's a, a commemoration of the exodus from Egypt. Why is it a commemoration of the exodus from Egypt? Because the exodus of Egypt, it says, it even mentions the Ten Commandments. I'm Hashem who took you out of Egypt. Why does it say Hashem that commanded you? I mean, that created you. Why does it say took you out of Egypt? The reason why it says took you out of Egypt was because in Mitzrayim, in Egypt, we saw every single Jew being saved. No Jew was left behind. And at the same time, we see that every Egyptian drowned. They didn't make it. We see Hashgacha Pratis. And that's where we're saying Yotzer Bereshis constantly, God cares about me and every little Yid in this planet. He's every attuned to all, every single one of us. He cares about us. He thinks about us. And um, no Jew is, is trivial or not, for, or not important. He didn't make us like the nations. Now, Goy does not mean something negative as people think. Goy just means nation. He didn't make us like the nations of the land, of the earth. What does that mean? Rav Dessler says it means nationalism. Other nations bond together. I once, he should be my, my holy, holy doctor that I once had, Dr. Shields, Allah Shalom, such a special person, best doctor I ever had in my life, and best on bench of Talmud Chacham and everything. Anyways, he used to have an office on St. Clair. Here is St. Clair is Little Italy in Toronto. And um, I remember one time when the Italians won the soccer competition, there were high school kids walking up and down St. Clair with Italian flags in groups. And one of the secretaries told me they were told by their parents they don't have to go to school that day because Italy won the soccer you know, won the soccer match, <laughs> whatever it was, they made such a big deal or any of these games, people are honking when they, when they win some kind of game. An interesting thing is on a side, most of the people on the teams are not even from that country. They're usually from other countries altogether, but we won, we won. You know, there's this nationalistic pride that people have. And even people happen to love the country. The Gemara says you, the country you live in finds favor in your eyes. People love people and they're, ah, oh, you know, you see a Torontonian when you're abroad, you know, oh, somebody from the Altaheim, from the old times, you know, like we have nostalgia for where we come from, you know? So he didn't make us like that. We're not supposed to be a nationalistic nation. We purposely got the Torah in the desert. It's not the land of Israel, even though the land of Israel is extremely holy and a huge gift and it's a mitzvah to walk six feet in the land of Israel. It's still... It's still, that's not what bonds us together. We Jews are not bound by color of skin. We're not bound of where you came from. We're bound by our, our desire to serve Hashem and to be his special nation, to take more things upon ourselves. I remember years ago, there was, I went to the X here in Toronto, the Canadian National Exhibition, and there was a, a guy selling jewelry and the name of his jewelry was Neely. So I went up to him and he looks at me and he said, first of all, he says, oh, you know, every time, it wasn't just me, I was with a friend. 
and both of us were there. I think somebody that's here right now maybe was with me that time. I think somebody here was. I won't say her name, not to embarrass her, but she's here right now listening. Anyways, he said that Neely stands for, he wanted us to know, Netzach Yisrael Lo Yishakir. He was a totally irreligious Jew saying that, the, the you know, so I, I said, now that's very interesting, you know? And um, then he says to us that Neely was a group fighting the underground in the, in the, in the war of independence in 1948. And Neely assisted, I forgot the name of the group, um, like Begin's group. They were assisting them in, you know, um, clandestinely conquering Israel when the British had their mandate. So he says that's why he named, he's a big supporter of the Neely party. And that's why he calls his jewelry Neely. And I was thinking to myself, Netzach Yisrael Lo Yishakir means like the eternity of the Jewish people doesn't lie. It's not talking about Israeli nationalism. It's talking about the Jews of the Torah. You know, interesting as an aside, he said at the end to me and my friend, he says, every Orthodox Jew I ever met has a glow on their face. I just thought that's a beautiful aside that he mentioned. But in any case, that it just, Lo Asanu Kigoyeha Ratzos, even Israelis can have nationalism, but we're not supposed to be like other people. We don't just have a blue and white flag with falafel. We, we are different. We're not based on nationalism. Lo Samanu Kamishpachos Adama. He didn't make us like the, the families of the ground. There are people that have common interests, and that's why they're friends. Like we find golfing buddies. There's sometimes people that are like they knit together or they're of, uh, I know there was a certain league in one of the Orthodox shuls in the city where they all made quilts. It was a long time ago, but there was a, some one shul in the city had this kind of thing. Desires, or let's say you like music. Desires is not what binds us together as Jews. We're not like uh, Goye Haratzos. We're not bound by nationalistic uh, common ground and we're not bound we're not bound by like like by desires that we have all you like hiking i like hiking you like swimming i like swimming it's nice it's good as for a friend but we love each other and we love hashem because of our common thing is jews that's really what binds us together he didn't make our interests our chalak our mission in life is not like the rest of the world's Every person has his own chalik. Every person has his own portion of what he's in the world to conquer, what his mission is. And that's his primary role, not his secondary role. Now, a person shouldn't define himself, I am a singer, or I am a dancer, or I am a whatever, or I'm, I have this profession or that profession. I am here. Our chalik is not like that of the rest of the world. We are here to serve Hashem. That's what we're here for. And the chilek is the um, goraleinu and our fate kechol hamonam. And our fate is not like that of the world. It says, ein mazal Israel. There's no luck for the Jewish people. You don't have a, you know, whatever your scope, horoscope is for the day. I mean, we believe there could be basic beginnings from horoscope. I do, I do, I mean, there are books written on it. By the way, your horoscope is according to your Hebrew month. And your horoscope definitely influences your kind of personality, but it's not, a person can daven. We believe you can overcome anything you have. You may have certain tendencies because of your horoscope, but a Jew does not uh, does not go by the rules of horoscope or any of these kind of things or their palmistry and all the other. We believe that in Mazel Yisrael, we are ruled by our, you know, by, by what Hashem wants us to be. We say a bracha about this every morning. We say, Sha'asali kol tzarki, you gave me my every need. Even if I woke up in the morning and the whole day started negatively, no matter what it is, I needed this. This is how our fate is. You gave me my fate and I have to know it's divinely given to me. It's not just happenstance that I don't have luck or whatever it is that a person has. It's not just coincidence. We believe everything was totally determined for each person. So we have a different chalik, a different portion in life than the rest of the world. And our fate is different than all other nations. We're treated different from all other nations, always. Why are the Jews picked on? Makes no sense in our modern day that Jews should have a different fate. We look like other people. We blend into the background and yet the Jews always stand apart. And it's so many years since they could blame us for other things. And they're still going on with it even today. Even today, they're still talking about the Jews. 
שהם משתחווים להבל וריק, because they bow down to hevel, which literally means steam, or uh, yeah, steam, vapor, whatever you want to call it. Reek means emptiness. Umispalim el lo yoshia, and they pray to a power that won't help them. I heard this, this is in the Medrash of Kohelis. It says the first verse of Kohelis, Havel, Havalim, Amar Kohelis, that's three times already because Havel is plural. Havel, Havalim, Hakol Havel. Seven times in the first verse of Kohelis, of Ecclesiastes, are we told that this world is vanity of vanities, emptiness, vapor, Havel, just breath, a breath. What does that mean when they say they bow down to Havel and reek? It means basically that it starts out, the whole Ecclesiastes starts out with talking about everything is vanity, says Hashem, I call Havel, everything is meaningless. Why does it say it like that? So it says in, um, in the Medrash of, of uh, Kohelis, it says every decade of a person's life, if you have to be, we're generalizing a lot here for, for purpose of just clarity, but this is basically it. Every decade of a person's life, there's a different thing that presents itself as our main challenge. The first 10 years of a life, for example, a lot is based on sweets. Like a baby is so oral, everything has to go in his mouth. Everything is the mouth, the taste, the everything. And child are very motivated by sweets, right? If you go to a teenager and you say, I'll give you 10 lollipops if you take out the garbage, they will look at you like, huh, are you nuts? Hevel, it's empty, it's meaningless, it's nothing. I need, uh, you know, some serious uh, thing. I need a, I need a, whatever it's called, those scooters that are that could have potentials of killing people, the electric scooters. Uh, I need this, I need that. And, you know, like I, I, I need, you know, different things as a teenager, you know, I have other things. I want my wheels. I want, you know, whatever it is that I need at that age. You go to somebody in their in their in their twenties, and you tell them, "I'll give you wheels." They say, "What are you talking about wheels? I want a shidduch. I want a shidduch. You know, I need I need to get married. That's what I'm. That's what's motivating me. That's what I want. I only want a shidduch. You know, or they want serious wheels. They want a real car or something else when they're in their twenties. You know, I want my career. In their thirties, you tell them you'll get them a shidduch. They already have their shidduch. They don't want that shidduch. They I've been trying to deal with how can I make the best of the shidduch that I have already. And, um, you know, they're trying to be a good spouse when they have to put up with now the negatives of a person besides the positives they knew about when they were dating. And then they're saying, I need a mortgage. I need, I need something more financial security. You turn to them in their 40s. They look back and they say the expression is small children, uh, small struggles, large children, large struggles, you know, <laughs> that, 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 you know, you look at, you said, I thought two-year-olds were difficult. I have teenagers now. And you're, and Mama mia, what am, how am I going to manage with teenagers? You know, you look at your fifties and you say, I wish I had the power of forties. I don't know if I can have children anymore. How long can I have children? You know, and I, and, and, and there's an empty nest syndrome in the fifties. Then you look back and you say, I wish the forties was hevel. I thought it was such a straggle and straight. I wish I could be 40. And the 40s look back and they wish the 30s were their struggle. When you're in your 60s, you all this aches and pains start coming in or whatever people have. And they start looking back at the 50s. Oh, the 50s, those were the easy days. The 70s look back at the 60s and the 80s look back at the 70s. Hakal Havel, all 70 basic years of a man's life or woman's life until they reach old age. It's all you look back. You thought it was terrible. It was all the things you, you, you know, were uh, ruminating about were nothing. They were absolutely nothing. Look back at them. You wish you had those times again. Or you could look back and you could say, I call Hava, like oh, they were emptiness. You see, you have a different perspective. Sometimes the older you get, you sometimes start noticing when you get older that, um, that a lot of the things that you were um, feeling were so important to you and so meaningful. You look back and you say, those things were so stupid. A lot of people say your best years are after you're in your 40s and, and beyond, because that's when you finally, a lot of stupidities exit your brain. Okay, so hey, mishtach avim hevel varik, the rest of the world worships meaningless stupidity. They worship who's looked at who's, a, who's the best looking actor, actress, or candidate for, for, uh, for office. <laughs> and they, they pray to a God or to a power that won't help them. What are we bowing down to? Who are we worshiping? Are we worshiping what people think of us? Are we worshiping, you know, it's very important we go to a grave site to da daven to the deceased. We're davening to Hashem. 
in memory of the deceased, you know, or not to worship a rebel like it would be a god, or not to worship Malachim even. It's only Hashem that we're worshiping. Then we say, Vanachtu Korim, we, we bow the knee. Bow the me knee really means the first step to get closer to Hashem is to learn how to give in to others, to give in to others. Ramatis Yo Solomon Shlita says that in the name of the Chassid Yaivitz, he brings down, he says, why were all the, the whole, all the um, Mashiach's uh, uh, ancestors are all like problematic relationships. They're all Yibum or this or that or the other. Why, why do we make such a big deal of that? And why do we make a deal of Yibum to marry like the deceased brother or sister? Why do we have a mitzvah like that? And he's Chassid Yaivitz brings down that the most difficult relationships to cultivate and the ones that are the most important are with our very own families. That's the, the laboratory for growth. And always what, what we're told at the, end, at the end of days, a person is asked, did you proclaim God as your king in the morning and in the evening every day? That means saying Shema, but it also means, did you have the idea, do you believe in Hashem morning and evening? And it also says, did you make your friend king over you with gentleness? And that's what we're supposed to practice to really give in to other people. The more we can give in to, the more we'll succeed in our relationship with Hashem. Okay, then the next comes Mishtachavim. This is in our external. This is you're actually bowing down. Our actions should proclaim Hashem's being the greatest thing in our life. Uh, so it's in your mouth and in your heart to do it. The more we externally practice that we're going to be giving in in our, in our life to other people and that we're going to be giving in our lives to Hashem, act it out even if you don't feel it and eventually become a part of ourselves and we will internalize it. One thing I told the story many years ago, but um, time for the story again, and that is the story of Jonas and Ipschitz. When he was a young man, he one time... Had, he was stuck. It was, it was like, I think it was before Yom Kippur, if I'm not mistaken. He didn't make it home for Yom Kippur. And he had to get off a wagon, which was delayed. And he ended up in a small town. He just said, you know, I've like three, four hours left till Yantif. I'm not going to make it. I'm going to spend Yom Kippur here. So he finds his way to the nearest shul. He tries to find a seat. And he sees the people there. Um, you know, he finds himself a seat. And then when the holiday starts, he notices he's davening next to a man with a long white beard who looks like very, um, you know, very elderly and very, who looks very holy. And he sees him crying in his davening to Hashem. He says, you know, like, I, I'm just dust and ashes in your eyes, Hashem. I just, I dust and ashes in life, Kalva Homer, when I die, Hashem, to you, I'm nothing. He was so impressed. He says, well, I'm excited. I'm here in a place where at least I'm not at home, but at least I'll be with people that are gonna be inspirational to me. They're gonna be talking about how they're like dust and ashes. That's very inspirational to me. So he was very happy, fortunate to be with this man. Anyways, the next day it was on Yom Kippur itself and they were giving out aliyahs and this man did not get the most coveted aliyah, which some shuls it's uh, uh, shlishi, some shuls it's uh, maftir. So this man saw, witnessed as another person was being called up to the Torah for shlishi this, he heard this man who was crying to Hashem, every Shvona Esri crying, I'm just the dust and ashes before you, Hashem. He hears this man saying, him you give Shlishi? Him you give Shlishi? And he turned to this Yid and he said, Rabbi Yid, don't talk like that. You know, it, you know, like I heard you davening and you're saying how just before Hashem, you're like dust and ashes. So we got Shlishi, it doesn't matter. He said, before Hashem, I'm like dust and ashes, but not before him. You know, so like, you know, everybody's got their line, like to give in means we, I, we demonstrate primarily how we serve Hashem by how we serve other people and how we're willing to give in to them. So it says, um, we're, and then we recognize, and then finally, after external actions of giving into others and proclaiming our ideals, like it says, um, if we speak a lot about Hashem, it brings us a muna. And then finally, we're moda. We we agree. We admit that um, that lifnei melech malche hamlachim akadosh baruch hu. We we admit before the King of all Kings, Hakadosh Baruch Hu, Shahu notes shemayim v'yoseid aretz. He places the heavens and he sets forth the land. 
Adesu says this means Hashem's first initial intention is to establish the Shemaim in the world. He had first spiritual ideas, and from the spiritual ideas, he created a world. And his, he's really dwells above anything we can actually imagine. But, and he's up there in the heavens above, but he deals with us little nudniks in the world. He's our God. There's nothing else. He's the true king. There's nothing beside him, like it says in our Torah. And you should know today and bring to your heart that Hashem is in the heavens above and in the earth below, no one else. Now, Ain Od, all hours, the all other powers in this world are null before him. So he's way above us, but he deals with us. Now we're told the Adata Hayom, you should know today and bring into your heart. What does that mean? One one idea of Yadata Hayom, like you should make it clear like the day and bring into your heart that there's nothing else but Hashem. Now, our Bali Musar tell us that there are thousands of miles from your head to your heart. Head and your heart are like two separate continents. You should know today, but you have to make it real and tangible to yourself that there's nothing else but Hashem. That only Hashem is the king. And when it says Emes Malkenu, he's the true king. There's nothing besides him. His kingship does not, not de depend on his subjects. He does, he's a true king, meaning he does, it doesn't matter how big of a country are you the president of or how many people voted for you. He's totally the king, whether we like it or not. And, he, and, and he's the one that deserves the, tr the real, he's not dependent on anything and he's above everything. That ends the testimony of Yoshua ben Nun. The next paragraph was actually written by someone else. The second paragraph in Aleinu, al kein nekaveh, therefore we will hope to you, Hashem. Those three words are the Rashi Tevos, are the acronym of Achan. Achan was the person in the time of Yoshua that stole from the booty. When Yericho fell, all the people were told, you're not allowed to take anything from the spoils of Yericho. Why? Because you have to realize this was a miraculous war. They just blew chauffeurs and the walls came down. They circled the city seven times, blew chauffeurs, the, the walls fell. Yoshua made a declaration in the, in the name of Hashem. Nobody's to take anything. Achan took things. He took a cloak. I believe from uh, the Babylonian king, plus gold and silver, and he buried it. And the next war that Yoshua fought, which was the Ai, um, another country, another area, um, the um, 36 people passed away. Some people say it was one, Yer ben Menashe, which was equivalent of 36 people. He died. And he said, he fell to his face, Yoshua. He says, I, I thought, Hashem, you love us. Why are people dying? And uh, he made a goral, he made a, a like a, a through lots, and it fell on the tribe of Yehuda, and then finally it fell on Achan. Achan at first denied that he had taken anything from the spoils, but later on he admitted. Now, some people say he was righteous, uh, he had righteous reasons, he felt he had a reason why he should take from the spoils. Other people say, no, he just gave in to his tithing, he lost out. But in any case, he did shuva. He said these words at his last moments on earth before they stoned him because this happened on Shabbos that he took from the spoils. Plus it was, you know, breaking Hashem's word. He was stoned, but his last words were the al kein the kaveh, and a heavenly voice came out that he sat in Shemayim with Avram Avinu and Yosef at Sadiq. So it just shows the power of tshuva equating Yehoshua with Achan, who was a sinner, that all of us can reach these levels if we just do tshuva. So he says, let's hope to you, Hashem, to see quickly Tifera Suzecha. What's Tifera Suzecha? The glory of your, of your strength. That means the base of Mikdash. Lavir Gilulim Minaaretz, to take away garbage. Galal means garbage. Bahalilim Karosi Karesun, and you should destroy all the idolatry. The Sakain Olam Malchus Shakai, to create, to, to, to correct the world in the kingdom of. Here Hashem calls himself by Shaddai, which means Sha'amar Lolamo Dai. There's a name of Hashem. It's not as holy as the other names. Dai means that like Hashem puts boundaries, like there is nature, like we, he hides himself in nature. So what does it mean we're going to correct the, correct the world, the Melchus Shakai? So some people explain that Shaddai means, Shaddai means to sharpen. 
that people's perception of God when Mashiach will come will be so clear that it'll be like a sharpened perception that everyone clearly will see that, um, you know, th 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 that Hashem exists and that he is really the king. And, and all the B'nai Basar, the lowest folks are going to call out your name. Even the wicked are going to at least turn to you. Maybe they won't proclaim in your name, but they'll turn to you. Um, they will recognize and know and internalize all the people of civilization. Because to you, they will all bend the knee. They will swear, all the, all the people will swear in your name, knowing that it's so clear as day that you're the only king, that everyone will swear to it. It'll be that clear to them. And then if, before you, Hashem, everyone's going to bow down and fall, and they'll, they'll give precious things for your name, and they'll accept your, your yoke of heaven. And you will rule over them soon, forever. You are the true king, and forever you're going to rule with kavod. Like it says in your Torah, Hashem will rule forever and ever. And then it says Hashem will be king over the whole world by Yomahu. And that day, Hashem will be one and his name will be one. Okay, so we have to say a few more things on this, and that is the following. We're going to say, even though we don't appreciate it, right now Hashem does rule over us. He's the Melech. He's not a Moshel that we that we he's Moshe Bagoyim. They don't well, they 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 don't realize, but Melech means he is indeed the king. Um, just just to, you know, not because of any force that was that was applied, but because that's who he is. Now, this whole thing is alluding to the future when everyone will proclaim in the name of Hashem. So much is mentioned like that in Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is when we are hoping for the time. We want Mashiach, not because. People won't be sick anymore, even though that will be a sidebar. But we want Mashiach because then everyone will recognize and finally appreciate Hashem. I always say the second less, at least a, um, um, appreciated person is a Jewish mother. But that's beside the point. But Hashem, considering what he has done for humanity, is so underappreciated and underrated. Most of the world doesn't even believe in God. And the people that do once a week, once a whatever, they, they, they say their little prayer here and there. But it's mostly do what you want. And forget about your source of all your inspiration of everything you have in your life. I just want to comment on one idea. So here, a person like that said, we should all proclaim your name forever. And this is a very inspiring prayer. And it really teaches us what we're here in the world for. Now, the, the, um, in this prayer, we talk about Kabbalah's old mouth of Shemaim. I'm just going to end with this thought. Accepting upon ourselves the yoke of heaven. Rav, 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 Rav Matisio Solomon Shlita says a beautiful concept of what this means. Why do we always, ex and we say that, the yoke of heaven. What does it mean, yoke? Yo, it sounds like really difficult. So Rav Matisio says a yoke has two purposes. It is supposed to facilitate the working of an animal. You put a yoke on an ox, so it'll schlep the carriage or whatever it may be that you want, or the plow, whatever you want to attach the, yoke, the, the oxen to. So there's two things that you need in the yoke. One, it should facilitate work. Like you should, the acceptance of God's kingship over us means we want to serve God with all our heart, but if the yoke is too heavy, we can't work at all. When we're going to be thinking about things to do for Yom Kippur or for Rosh Hashanah in general, not to jump a skip steps on the ladder. We have to do something that facilitates us serving God. And it should be, he says, uh, Nelson Vakobel says, if it's a question of something that'll make us happy and something that won't, you should err on the side of simcha. But it should be the, a yoke, and yet this yoke facilitates work. So it can't be something too heavy. It has to be something we personally can accomplish that to, to get us more in the, the realm of serving God. So this is in the paragraph of Malchios in the Shmona Esrei. This is three themes on Rosh Hashanah, and the primary theme, which we'll expand upon because this is really the primary theme of Rosh Hashanah, is to make God king. We're renewing our vows. You're our king, Hashem. I'm the servant. And that's all I'd like to close with for today. I hope, Amir Hashem, you all have an amazing week. And we'll be back next week, Amir Hashem, Tuesday night at 8. Thank you, Bina Markovic, for facilitating this with so little time and, and being able to put it together. 
I thank you all for listening. And anyone, um, I'm going to be giving a share in the morning. The morning class is going to be starting next week. It'll be 9.30 and afterwards it'll be at 10 following weeks. But the morning class is not there behind we are that, that where we are. So they're going to not have the benefit of the Elenu. Unless I've changed my mind, I don't know yet. But um, we'll see where they go. But anyways, I thank you all for listening. And I wish you all a very productive week. And exiva v'chasima taiva. Thank you very much for listening.